han matado a la comunidad, han matado a los padres, han matado a, a, a los padres de, de la comunidad allá en, el, en la UCA. general way, a great way to understand what happened in El Salvador is to begin with General Congregation 32. So general Congregation within the Society of Jesus is a time when representatives from all the Jesuit provinces come together in Rome to discuss and decide and sometimes elect a new leader uh, or to decide on issues of real importance. One of the main things was uh, articulating and promulgating a mission statement for our Society of Jesus today that would be in line with our original documents. It took a long time to do it, and we finally arrived at it in March of 1975. Now here we are in the early days of December when we're just beginning to discuss this whole thing. Let me call it faith and justice. I can use that shorthand now, I think. Father Pedro Rupe has been a great inspiration to many of us Jesuits and our colleagues, and a very critical part of his gift to us came in a talk he gave to Jesuit alumni, worldwide alumni of the Jesuit schools in Valencia, Spain in 1973. He began that talk by asking, have we educated you for justice? For many of them, that was such a foreign question. We went to a Jesuit school to become professionals, to become successful, what do you mean educated us for justice? And he said, I, I want to apologize that I don't believe we did educate you for justice. And he gave a marvelous talk in which he talked about our mission in education as forming women and men for others. Because he said, first of all, it means a basic attitude of respect for all people which forbids us to ever use them as instruments for our own profit. It's a firm resolve never to profit from or allow ourselves to be suborned by positions of power deriving from privilege. For to do so, even passively, unintentionally, is equivalent to active oppression. To be drugged by the comforts of privilege is to become contributors to injustice as silent beneficiaries of the fruits of injustice. An attitude not simply of refusal, but of counterattack against injustice. A decision to work with others toward the dismantling of unjust social structures so that the weak, the oppressed, the marginalized of this world might be set free. And what Arupe helped us see in those days in preparing the Society of Jesus for a transformed vision of forming women and men who could make a difference in this world because they had a faith that wanted to do justice, including not being a part of unjust social structures and actually dismantling them so that the poor, the oppressed, the marginal in our world benefit from what we do. Now, in terms of the general context for the war, El Salvador is a tiny country in Central America. And we have to remember that when the Spanish colonized Latin America, they divided up the land among the conquistadors, the, the captains and the, the military leaders of the expedition. And El Salvador was divided up between about 14 or 15 captains. And so right from the very beginning, you had a very few number of people who owned very large tracts of land. And those families that own those tracts of land that can be traced all the way back to the conquistadors uh, basically came to dominate the economy of this country. And so we had great inequality in El Salvador. We had, and some, some say the percentage was as high as 90% of the money in El Salvador prior to the war was going through about 100 hands, about, about 14 families, control the vast majority of the 
economy of El Salvador. And by inequality, I don't mean that some people had a little less than others. I mean that there were those who were fabulously wealthy, who had lots of land, exported goods, and those whose children were dying before the age of five because they couldn't feed them. So there was deep, deep poverty. And when people started asking themselves about the causes of that poverty, they started looking at the inequality in that society. So they said, wow, 14 families own 80 to 85 percent of all of the wealth in this country while people are starving. Is there a way that we can change that and make it more humane? And the church was very much in the front of that questioning. What they were trying to do was to, was to respond to the political struggles in their own time in a way that really uh, enabled the, the country to flourish, uh, to stop the Civil War, to address the needs of the poor, to make it possible for this whole population of human beings to have a better life. The oligarchy, and by the oligarchy we mean the, the, the very wealthy upper class of El Salvador, um, had stolen the elections of 1972 and 1977 from the people who had elected a different government. And so it's important to understand that the people of El Salvador tried to change their reality through democratic means first. Shortly after 1977, the, the level of frustration rose to the point where a number of different groups formed to fight the government with arms. Some were of Marxist inspiration, others were of Christian inspiration. And in 1980, they decided that they needed to come together in order to have any chance at all of defeating the government. So these five groups came together into what was called the FMLN. And so the Civil War began in 1980. <laughs> en los cerros que estaban bombardeando. Por eso digo, es, era un tiempo de desapariciones, de secuestros, de miedo, porque, de intimidación a cierto punto. ¿eh? And you had armed peasant groups, you had the church working in rural communities, you had the government basically supporting a military that was trying to not change the country. Um, and that is kind of the context for uh, the, both the Civil War and the way in which the Jesuits got involved in it. Fue un día jueves, me acuerdo, algo que nunca se me va a borrar, un 16 de noviembre del 89. Eh, sucede algo muy, muy triste. The voiceless, for the people uh, who had nothing, uh, who were being deprived of rights, being treated unjustly. So the university felt that they had an obligation to speak for these people, but speak as a university, not as a political arm, but as a university. And this was in accord with our Jesuit mission which we had, uh, we had defined after a long, difficult time as service of faith, which is obvious. But service of faith had to include a promotion of justice. So the University of Central America was founded in 1965, and it was really founded to, to serve society by the Jesuits. And in 1979, uh, the, the university came together to sort of reflect upon what kind of university it wanted to be in light of the General Congregation 32 in 1975. And 
it really came out with language that was very distinctive for itself. It said it wanted to see itself as being in service to the world, and this included three parts. So the UCA said it wished to work first for social change, second in a university manner, and third guided by a Christian inspiration. In the first statement, it said that the UCA exists for social change. And that's really important. It, it doesn't exist primarily for its students or its faculty or its campus or anything else. It really exists to serve society. And that, they took that very seriously. And so what it did is in a university manner, so what does a university do? It teaches disciplines. It teaches the social sciences. It teaches the empirical sciences, chemistry, biology, physics, engineering. It teaches the humanities. But you can teach those in such a way that you're that you're putting them at the service of the society around you, okay? Um, so it's, it's really important to understand that when you take the sciences and you apply them to real problems around you, you're being an academic engaged with the world. I remember that during the time that when I was taking the classes with them, they always told us, be students with a critical judgment, with a critical analysis of what happens on a national level, national de lo que sucede en el mundo, lo que sucede en el pueblo de Centroamérica. Saying that the UCA was inspired, had Christian inspiration means that um, its worldview was one of hope. It had a passion for justice. It wanted to change the conditions that led to suffering in society. Uh, it was generous. Uh, and finally, uh, it did reject a violent conclusion to the war. As part of its Christian inspiration, uh, violence as a form of social change was unacceptable. Both sides saw negotiation as a kind of failure, as a selling out, almost as a cop-out. And the UCA really said, you know, the best thing for the country is for us to negotiate. By doing the kind of research that they were doing to really promote this vision of justice in all these different areas of learning, that stepped on the feet, if you will, of the power structure. And so then they were killed for that reason. Father Ignacio Ecoria, who was the rector president, so that, that means both the head of the Jesuit order at the university as well as the president of the university, was internationally known as a human rights activist uh, and as a sort of negotiator. Uh, there was one point during the Civil War where he was actually on national TV with the leader of the right and the leader of the left debating right in the middle about the best ways to end the war, um, you know, directly confronting uh, the people and, and arguing for the best way to settle this. You also had Father Ignacio Martin Barro, um, and he was second in charge at the UCA. And he was the director and founder of the Public Opinion Institute at the University of Central America, which sort of tracked trends and people's opinions and ideas. As a dean of the psychology department, he was also an internationally renowned pioneer in the field of social psychology. He was also the pastor of a rural community uh, known as Hayake. Um, which was very, very oppressed during the war. And he would drive out from the UCA, as many of the Jesuits did, and he would walk with and accompany these communities as they were suffering from the military oppression at the time. Y con Segundo Montes, me acuerdo que él nos daba la, la clase de sociología. La sociología es bien amplia. Entonces, desde allí también nos hacía pensar, nos hacía analizar. Bueno, esta es la teoría, pero la práctica, ¿cómo están viendo esto? Entonces nos hacía como sensibilizar, como a, a tener más amplitud de conocimiento de lo que estaba sucediendo, eso, eh, sucediendo en cuestión social, en cuestión política. Entonces, para mí fue como una ventana abierta a, a mi mente, ¿verdad? Para ver todas estas eh, injusticias que estaban sucediendo en, en América Central, especialmente pues, en El Salvador, donde yo estaba viviendo. All together, they were a powerful entity trying to come to a peaceful solution for this conflict. The martyrs were so important for us because they were in a university. They were university professors. But they did what they did in their individual different disciplines 
on behalf of those who are struggling. The mission of the Jesuit University is to do all things to make it possible for human beings to flourish in the culture of their time, in the world of their time. And I don't just mean a few. I mean, we're talking about how does, how does it make it possible for everyone to flourish? Uh, what does it mean to be a Jesuit in Catholic University in Omaha, Nebraska? Um, how does what the Jesuits did in El Salvador challenge us? How do we understand the purpose of Creighton? I mean, the issue is we are not El Salvador, the United States, or the central part of the United States where Creighton is right now, Omaha, Nebraska. We are not, we don't have quite the same dimensions of problematic that the Salvadoran people had. On the other hand, we do have economic discrepancy, we have social discrepancy, we have circumstances and situations where people are really suffering because they are not given an equal opportunity or an equal or equal rights in all cases. Do we connect the sciences that we teach and the humanities that we teach and the medicine and the dentistry and the law that we teach to the problems around us here? Do we actively engage? Uh, these aren't rhetorical questions because the answer is in many cases is yes. Uh, the question is, are we doing as much as we could? Educar a los estudiantes o a las personas para que sean también portavoz hacia afuera en los diferentes ámbitos, ¿no? diferentes carreras, diferentes estudios y poder desarrollarse como seres humanos con una calidad humana más fraterna, más solidaria, más justa. What is this teaching about justice? What is justice, for example, in comparison to charity? So charity, as we know, is, is really important and really good. Um, it's when you meet the immediate needs of someone, okay? Uh, so if I go down and I donate something to a homeless shelter and it's eaten that day, that's a form of charity. Someone has a need, I provide for it, and then that's it. Justice asks, why is there that need? And what can I do to change the existence of that problem. That's really what justice is. So we have to find ways to address the social problems, the economic problems, the moral problems, the, the great questions of Omaha, Nebraska in 2014, 15, 16, 17, whatever year it is, we have to find the ways of addressing those problems. And there's no better place than a university in the United States for doing that because we have a collection of some of the best minds in the world in one place. Can we call ourselves a university sponsored by a society that has committed itself to a faith that does justice and ignore or set ourselves apart from the communities in which we live? Um, how do we do that here at Creighton? How can we do that better here at Creighton? For us to honor their memory is to continually ask ourselves, how can what we specialize in be on behalf of those people who need our voice, who need our expertise, who need the difference we can make so that this world will continue to grow to respect the dignity of every human person?